disruption is a process, not a single event. It begins by a commitment to excellence and taking a stand. But disruption can have consequences. On January 8, 2010, I stood before the federal prison at Big Springs, Texas, looking up at the barbed wire that surrounded the facility. I was about to enter into that facility to begin serving a 14-year sentence for attempted witness tampering. And I found this surreal. How could I, after devoting myself to the legal profession for 35 years, be in this position? I hearkened back to the fact that I started off as a prosecutor with the New York State Special Prosecutor's Office, an office that was created to disrupt the normalcy of bribery and favors in the criminal justice system by judges, prosecutors, and cops. When we started, we were ballyhooed because of our success in prosecuting police. But as our targets changed to judges and politicians, the community that controls everything, the establishment, took a step in. And they fired the head of the office. They brought in a replacement who tamped down our investigations. And in the meantime, the appellate courts threw out all of our prosecutions against judges and politicians. I decided to leave. But there was a consequence to my involvement in that office. That consequence was that none of those people, none of the judges, none of the prosecutors, the cops, ever forgot my role in that office where I had been very aggressive. That was the consequence. And by happenstance, and as I entered into private practice, disruption became my mantra. I began to represent an individual named Henry Hill. Many of you know him probably from the movie Goodfellas as he was depicted by Ray Liotta. But Henry, I arranged for him to avoid being prosecuted in any case, federal or state. And as Henry began to testify against the Lucchese crime family and disrupt their activities, I began to realize that I had cut myself off from a principal form of criminal representation that I had desired, the mafia. But I was representing the biggest rat of them all, and they didn't want to have me as an attorney. So I tried to figure out how to monetize Henry. And so I tried to sell his story. And it became a number one best-selling book, and the movie Goodfellas, which was all good, but the consequence was it reminded the mafia of who Henry was and who I was. And so without mafia clients as a potential source of income, I began to represent people of color who were charged with major narcotic violations from New York to LA. And now I had a new adversary, federal prosecutors. They were used to winning 98% of their cases. But now I was winning 98% of them. And in doing so, I was exposing the fact that federal prosecutors were as guilty as anybody else of engaging in misconduct, in coaching witnesses to say things that weren't true, in hiding evidence. And so I had a new adversary, government prosecutors. But that didn't stop me. I continued to go after them as hard as I could. But the more famous and notorious my clients became, Fat Cat Nichols, Kenneth McGriff, and the Supreme Team, didn't matter 
what I did and how I did it, I was now being associated with my clients and looked upon in the same way as if I were the client by the federal prosecutors. This was a problem. And they began to hurl accusations at me repeatedly. They couldn't believe that they were losing these cases. And they had to conclude in their own minds that I was doing it either with hocus pocus or with misconduct on my part. And as they continued to do that, I looked for an avenue to change their view of me. I came upon a white collar case in which a banker had been charged with lending Saddam Hussein billions of dollars. I thought, well, a white collar case, this will change their view of me. I'm no longer the Prince of Harlem, as they referred to me. The problem was that I approached that case like I had every case since the beginning of my legal career. I subpoenaed the President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, among others, in an effort to prove that the United States had in fact been behind the loans that they were accusing my client of making. My co-counsel in the case, Stephen Sadow, now Trump's attorney in Georgia, said to me, how could you represent this fellow and how could you take on the federal government and accuse the Department of Justice of misconduct? Well, we'll see what Steve does with that coming in Georgia. In any event, I now had earned yet another enemy at the highest level of government. And I beat them down with subpoenas that I've just talked about, among other things. And they ultimately took a 347 count indictment where my client faced life imprisonment to giving him a plea in which he served six months. He then was released and in two months was poisoned and killed. I moved on back to representing people of color in, in narcotic cases and the government continued to hurl accusations against me. And I looked at it, all the accusations, as though it was a badge of honor because I knew I was beating them. Why else would they be making these accusations? None of them had any truth. So I continued down that same road. And then in 2008, the government decided they'd had enough. And so they sent an informant into my office. The informant was wired and scripted. He was supposed to say that he was going to help us locate witnesses, and he was going to arrange to have them come to our office. But in addition to saying he would help us, he suggested violence against the witnesses. He suggested bribery of the witnesses. And I didn't say anything to say no because if you're a prosecutor or a criminal defense attorney, this is the nature of the way people speak. And you don't put your hand up and say, stop in the name of the law. Because wives or husbands in divorce cases, they all say they want to kill their spouse. People in criminal cases, they all want to say, I want to kill the prosecutor, I want to kill the judge, I want to kill somebody because they're so frustrated. So you hear it, and you hear it, and you ignore it, and you ignore it. And when he would leave our office at the end of a day, my staff and I would laugh about his comments. But it was no laughing matter. Because we, that is, one of the young attorneys in my office and myself, were indicted for attempted witness tampering based upon the conversations I had had in the office with the informant. I thought this was outrageous. I, I almost laughed when I heard the charges. But nonetheless, after a six-day trial and seven days of jury deliberation, the jury convicted us. And the judge who oversaw the case, who I had never gotten along with in 25 years, sentenced me to 14 years in prison. At 62, I was frightened, 
I was beyond myself in terms of trying to figure out how I would take care of myself inside of a prison, how I would take care of my family. But I was lucky. When I entered the prison walls, all of the work I had done on behalf of people of color came back to me. The Hispanics and the blacks came to my aid. They protected me. They knew of me and they were grateful for what I had done. So I tried to help them and I prepared papers that helped them get their sentences reduced or in some cases get their, conviction, get their convictions overturned. And after serving 10 years in prison, I was released. I was disgraced, I was disbarred, but I was undaunted. And so I tried to figure out how I would continue to be a disruptor. And on a radio show I hosted, and at conferences where I lobbied judges, and at law schools where I spoke to the students, I continued my message. And just to paraphrase, Congressman, a congressman uh, from Baltimore, Elijah Cummings, he would say, speak out, speak up, get in the way, get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And I would add to that, that I don't think life has meaning, real meaning for us, unless you're prepared to tilt at windmills. So thank you very much.